So modeling, you know, it's really yes. the first step. We, we tell things to our kids, don't scream, and we're screaming, yes. or don't be on your devices all the time where we're stuck on our phones. You know, it doesn't make sense. So if you want to tell uh, your son as a mother, you have to respect women, but you are allowing your own spouse to disrespect you in front of them, it, it won't make sense. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. Hi everyone and welcome to Conversations with Lulu. On the occasion of International Women's Day, I wanted to tackle the topic from a mental health standpoint. What is the impact of the inequities that we women face in our day-to-day -day lives on our mental health? And what can we men and women collectively do about it? I have a lot of respect and admiration for my guest, Kareen El Khazan Hadati. She is a clinical psychologist and she currently leads the psychology services at the American Center for Psychiatry and Neurology in Dubai. Kareen is an expert in eating and weight disorders and has created a CBTE Center of Excellence in Dubai. She has been practicing for two decades. This is going to be very exciting. Let's tune in. Welcome to the show, Kareen. Thank you for inviting me. It's great, great to have you, really. <laughs> Thank you. So Karin, I thought, you know, on the occasion of International Women's Day, I think every panel and every talk in the country is gonna be talking about, you know, the gender gap and, uh, and the pay gap and the glass ceiling and all these things. I wanted us to talk about it from a mental health perspective uh, and also maybe address some of the root causes of this, which is how do we raise uh, young, mm. uh, I don't want to say strong because we don't necessarily have to be strong, but maybe resilient, content. Uh, can you can you tell us your thoughts on this? Yes, I think, as you said, I mean, uh, it's not about being strong as per society's expectations. Strong can can be different for me or for you. Yes. Um, the understanding of what strong is. I think, like for every children, we need to start by having a secure and stable and safe family environment. It's difficult. I mean, yes, resilience, you can grow out of trauma and be resilient, but these are exceptions. So I think the first step is to, to have um, this structure at home, which provides a sense of safety. And um, the second one, I think, is not to make any difference between boys and girls and not to, you know, have having different kinds of expectations on them. And um, something that I've been thinking about lately, about um, this question, uh, because of our society's expectations, yes, uh, you know, we tend to put girls in boxes and we, tell, we tend to tell them what they should do or should not do, what they can do or cannot do. So I see I have a friend who's a very famous consultant woman, and she just brainstormed her daughter to become you know, this strong, successful woman. But maybe the daughter doesn't want to, yes. you know? So, um, and it's the same at home. I've started by doing that with my, with my two daughters. And, and then I realized that they are all, I mean, both of them are different and maybe different uh, from me. So, so what I try to do is basically to open opportunities for them, choices, and to teach them that we do not have to be the slave of our society's expectation. And it's not all or nothing. You do not have to be at home or a very successful woman. And uh, at the same time, you know, you have to do what makes you content, I'm not going to use the word happy, and what is in line uh, with your true self. So uh, if you are um, someone who does not want to pursue a career, it should not be, impo it should not be imposed on you. You should have choices and not boxes. But how do you, how do you, um, I mean, there, I think there's a fine line between, you know, okay, follow your true passions, tell me what you are interested in, as a girl and also guiding, you know? So wh where does the line uh, begin or end when it comes to guiding your kids to maybe go in the right direction? Because I think when you're young, it's, it's very difficult for you to know what you want to be and what you're passionate about, et cetera. Um, I think we need to teach them some, some important things in life, uh, things that we, you know, have, have um, have learned through experience. So, so for example, no matter what you want to do, I try to teach my daughters to be independent. 
and I think it's a very, I mean, even if she wants to do whatever she wants to do, she doesn't have to be to earn millions and she doesn't have to be the most successful career woman in the world, but she must, I believe, be independent because automatically, you know, um, if she is in a relationship, it will create a balance. And, uh, and you know, she needs to to earn her living, you know, where we are not there for her forever. I mean, we are there for her forever, but not financially. I always tell my three children, I owe you an education. <laughs> and after that, you're on your own. So there are some basic things that I think, you know, we need to, to teach them. But beyond that, this expectation that you should be at home or that you should be a successful career woman or that you should do both, um, these are boxes. So I think this is the best gift we can offer our girls is to tell them that what society expects from you is not necessarily, you know, does not necessarily work for you. And you have freedom of choice yeah. with the basics, which are being able to be independent. Financially. And financially, yes, yes, absolutely. Being yeah. able to be independent financially. I think it's very important. It, it's... Uh you know, it's interesting because I feel that the expectations on boys and girls, uh, they're completely different, right? And I feel that in our society, we tend to measure success by financial returns. So how much money do you have in the bank is usually a, a measure of how successful you are. Uh, and, and it's interesting because I hear parents, you know, I'm a parent, you're a parent, I'm sure you've heard this before, but when you hear parents saying, oh, like they want to be an artist or they want to be, uh, I don't know, in some position that is deemed, you know, not uh, not something that will make you a lot of money. Typically, parents like try to discourage that or try to push their children in a specific direction. But one, what I wanted to um, to ask you specifically is, why do you feel are, um, there are so many different expectations on our sons and on our daughters from from that perspective? I think it's historical, you know, historically men are uh, providers and women are homemakers. And in our region, this is not really changing a lot. Um, though, you know, in, the, in other parts of the world, it is changing. And this is, I believe, problematic because again, you're putting both of them in boxes. So, uh, so, so basically girls are taught that the priority is to be a homemaker and then, you know, if you, if you have time, if you wish, if you need the money, yeah. then yes, you need to have the degree to be able to, um, you know, some, some families need to be, uh, I mean, most of the time, nowadays, you need to have a double income to be able to sustain a good uh, quality of life. But um, this is like a plus or something that... Mm -hmm. um, not expected. Not expected. Yes. Uh, except if you need it for, you know, for financial reasons. And, uh, and again, you know, a lot of women, because of this uh, pressure to be a homemaker, uh, might not pursue careers that they would like to pursue. So, for example, I'm thinking about the medical field. How many girls, you know, like um, 17, 18 year, year old patients that I have had that tell me, yes, I want to do medicine, but you know, my family is telling me that, you know, I'm not going to be able to raise children. How are you going to raise children if you are on call at night? And others um, end up choosing maybe, you know, less demanding specialties because they want to be able to be flexible where maybe they want to be a brain surgeon, you know? So, so it's very limiting and it's sad because really you, you only do well what you like at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, for boys, what I see, and this is more and more, you know, I believe problematic, is that also they are put in those even, you know, more rigid boxes that in order to be a provider, you need to be in a stable profession. Um, so first, you know, boys are, are not really expected to express any emotions, boys don't cry, so they are a bit disconnected from their uh, sensitivity, you know, so, so uh, their um, creativity. So uh, because of that and because of those expectations that you should follow a career that is going to, you know, uh, make you earn money or that is stable and safe, they might not pursue other um, professions that are deemed less masculine, for example, being a fashion designer or doing performing arts. Uh, so <clears throat> I think it's a lose-lose for both sexes, for both genders. Those expectations. Yes, those very rigid expectations. 
And, um, and I see it, you know, later on when these um, children become adults and become my patients and all of them, you know, regret or really resent their parents because they've been doing things that they don't really enjoy because this is what they've been told to do. And, and then they are at this crossroads and they have responsibilities, they have children. Can they now, you know, pursue their dreams? It, it's complicated. Uh, so we need, I think, all of us to, to think a bit outside the box and, uh, and to, to help our children nurture their inner, you know, what they truly internally like and want to do. Bearing in mind that, again, all of us, we need to be financially independent. Yes. Are there, apart from the, like, the career um, topic, are there, do you see also other differences when we raise uh, boys and girls in terms of expectations, maybe not on the career front? I mean, yes, boys are expected to be strong and not to display any emotions, and boys don't cry, yeah. and, you know, it's okay for girls to be emotional, uh, where, you know, in reality, some girls are not emotional, and some boys are extremely sensitive and extremely emotional. So this leads to they repression. They get bullied for that, probably. Sorry? They get bullied for that, They probably. get bullied, and also, you know, it creates a lot of mental health problems, because when you're not allowed or you don't have the space to express your emotions, you are going to repress it, and it's going to have to come up one day one way or the other one day or the other uh, <clears throat> you know so so I, I think this is a big problem as well these these expectations as to how to be emotionally and I think as building on that you know as as men as boys become men and uh, and we see some of these problems perpetuating in the workplace uh, and also in life so you have a lot of men that don't necessarily respect women. Uh, women are judged on on uh, on many things, not only on their capability, but how they look and how good of mothers they are mm. and other criteria. <clears throat> so, so are there things that uh, that we need to um, tell men or teach men as they're growing up? Uh, boys, boys, mm, yes. yes. How you know that will eventually as they get older, become more respectful of women just for, you know, not because of their gender, but just be respectful in general? Definitely. I think, again, you know, in a household where you have girls and boys, the expectations should be the same or the opportunities should be the same. You don't send your son to the U.S. because he's a boy and then the girls have to go to an, a neighboring university, though she has the potential yeah. to, and, and she would like to go to an Ivy League, for example, and she could, but no. You know, we have this amount of money, which I can understand, and the priority is uh, for it to go to the boy. Or other scenarios, like sometimes I'm sure I'm at my friend's house and then, you know, the, the sister is expected to cater to the brother, you know, bring him this, um, uh, you know, you're upstairs, let, uh, please can you get his laptop down? Why? Let him go up and get his laptop. Why are women supposed to serve men? You know, it starts there. And I think another important part is, uh, you know, how fathers are with uh, their spouses. So how fathers yes. are with mothers. If you have a father that, you know, looks down at women, it's going to be there even if he doesn't express it, though most of the time they do express yeah. it. You know, that's the message that women are inferior to men and they need to be treated differently. And if a mother is kind of submissive and accepting of being treated that way and not modeling strong boundaries, it also sends the message to um, her son and her daughters uh, that it's okay, you know, that, uh, yeah, women deserve to be like that and, and are not allowed to express emotions or to set boundaries. So modeling, you know, it's really... Yes. The first step, we, we tell things to our kids, don't scream, and we're screaming, yes. or don't be on your devices all the time where we're stuck on our phones. You know, it doesn't make sense. So if you want to tell uh, your son as a mother, you have to respect women, but you are allowing your own spouse to disrespect you in front of them, it, it won't make sense. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. That's the first thing, you know, I learned when I became a mother is that it doesn't matter what you say, it's just how you behave and they will absorb everything. Yes. You can't fool them. You can't fool them, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Karin, you're, you're an expert on eating disorders. Uh, and I think particularly for women, it's a, it's a very, very big issue and, and, and topic because 
again, women, I think, are judged more unfairly when it comes to how they look versus men. The expectations uh, are that you should look a certain way. So how do you promote uh, a positive body image you know, as, as these girls are, uh, are growing up? Yes, I believe this is a crucial topic because a lot of, I mean, most self-esteem issues come from this uh, negative self-image. Yes. I think we live in a society based on appearances and, um, and uh, you know, in the last, uh, I would say, three, four decades, there has been this emphasis on how your body should, like, uh, should look like, yeah. knowing that those standards have evolved but still the pressure, you know, uh, was there. It's more, you know, it's more prevalent now because of the rise of social media. Um, I think the, the, the key point is really not associating the way your body looks to your value or worth. This is the main problem that we see when we treat uh, people with disordered eating or eating disorders who suffer from body image. It's, it's as if, if they cannot control their bodies and make it look as they're expected to look, they are unworthy. Unworthy of love, unworthy of everything. And this is a message that comes from home, you know, like families who, as mothers, fathers who value their own, you know, um, not physical appearance, but how their bodies look and put an emphasis on it, you know, so uh, um, commenting on our own bodies as parents, uh, commenting on our children's body, putting them on diets, uh, always praising those who are thin and that look like society is asking them to look and shaming those who are in bigger bodies or different bodies. This, this you know, sends the message that if you're not in this type of body, something is wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And this is why you engage in this you know, really a terrible pursuit of wanting to change your body in order to be uh, loved by your parents. It starts there and accepted and valued. Um, and then, uh, of course, later on, the reality is that people in larger bodies suffer from microaggression. There is a lot of weight stigma in our society. So you can understand that they would want to shield themselves from that and really try to reduce the body weight as much as possible in order to fit in and to protect themselves. However, the problem is not the individual, it's our society. Uh, and those pursuits often lead to more weight gain and or uh, developing an eating disorder. So it starts at home, of course. Uh, so my advice to every parent is to never comment on your own body, on what you eat, uh, not to attach moral value on the things we eat so we are not what we eat. It's not because I have a burger that I'm a bad person or I'm, you know, I lack self-control or you know, I'm weak or greedy. And it's not because I eat um, fruits and veggies and clean food that I'm a better person <laughs> and I have self-control. It has nothing to do, on the contrary, the healthiest people, healthiest people I know in terms of nutrition are people who suffer from anorexia nervosa who are the unhealthiest of them all. And, um, there's this myth that if you are in a larger body, you, you are unhealthy. Though we know, and so many studies have debunked that myth, your um, health has nothing to do with your BMI. Of course, I'm not talking about extremes. Uh, what it has to do with is basically how active you are, no matter your body weight. So, um, I mean, all those lies are promoted by a dieting industry who wants you to diet that you, you know, you pay money. And at the same time, they feed you and they expose you to this highly palatable processed food that is very difficult to resist because yeah. they're in front of you. And you're faced with this mixed message, you, you know, food is there. If you don't eat it, you feel frustrated. And at the same time, you need to look a certain way. And then you eat this food and then you diet. And both industries are making a lot of money. Absolutely. So we are caught in a trap. And the, the other thing that people don't know and that is, you know, though very, I mean, more and more spoken about is that there's something called a genetic set weight. So we are all born with a body type and shape and a number of fat cells and the disposition of those fat cells. And we have little control on it. So really those, you know, pursuits of, of changing my body and, and looking at a different way, you can't really do that. I mean, 
you have to really dedicate your, la your life to eating a certain way and counting your macros and going to the gym like uh, five hours a day if you want to modify your body shape. Otherwise, even if you look, uh, even if you lose weight, your body is going to look the same, just smaller. Mm -hmm. And and this is something that you know most of my patients who suffer from eating disorders don't know. Like as they have this light bulb moment, ah. You know, <laughs> so so yes, I I believe we are victims of both industries, and at home it's important to liberate children from um, from such uh, you know uh, lies, and also to teach them to value themselves based on other things. So uh, your values, your own values, your qualities, uh, the type of person you are, and uh, what you do in life versus how your body looks. And the, the, as you said, the research is out there, the, the, the information is out there, so all we need to do as parents is to look it up and try to educate ourselves, right, about the best way to do this. Yes, and, and for, for example, a very basic fact which you can find everywhere is that dieting doesn't work. So uh, people who diet regain, 95% of dieters regain the lost weight or more within one to five years. And if you don't develop an eat, and that's if you don't develop an eating disorder in the main time. So if you have a child who is overweight, number one, understand that genetically, this child might be in a bigger body. And it's okay because we all come in different body shapes and sizes and our society tells us we need to look a specific way. This is, I mean, we are the slaves of our society at the end of the day. And two, the best way to get your child to be even more overweight is to put him on a diet. And I'm not going to even go into the, the, the terrible you know, damage that it's going to cause his mental health if he doesn't develop an eating disorder. So really, you know, as, a, as a mother, as, as parents, you can control what your child eats without talking about it. You, know, you don't have to feed your child fast food every day. Uh, but if you, you know, give, provide uh, a majority of... Uh, fresh whole foods at home without saying ah this is so healthy this mm. is so good we're so amazing as a family because we eat, we don't eat fast food this is so bad uh, but you are controlling you are providing this food you're not commenting there's no value good or bad value and then you are you know allowing not allowing providing also fun food but in a controlled way so so th this is a model that can work but depriving children from a specific type of food is only going to make them eat them behind your back. And I'm sure yeah. you've noticed yes. that. But you can control it to a certain extent. As uh, definitely, younger. definitely. Uh, and do you think those those kind of eating habits, values or habits, habits yeah, would stick uh, I mean, as they become teenagers? I mean, because for, I think for you sure. can control a certain degree. Yes, uh, when they become teenagers, you can control a certain degree. And... Um, for unfortunately when they start socializing it's around these types of foods the fast food because yes. it's cheaper and this is what teenagers like and most of the time have been deprived from at home so but if you create those habits i mean they're still living at home right uh, teenagers yes. so you're still providing these types of food and how uh, and home is not a restaurant so so basically you know you don't want to eat this then you know fine there's nothing else it's not oh mom i don't like this order me chicken nuggets so you are controlling to a certain extent because what you're providing at home is balanced and nutritious and then when they go out they're going to do whatever they want and if they have the habit as children to have this balance between having a fruit and having a sweet and having a home cooked meal and having the fast food it should stay within their system, except if they have been deprived from that growing up, and then you go, you are going to see, you know, uh, a lot of teenagers. Open the floodgates. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> On fries and uh, okay. So the, the 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 lesson here is basically we shouldn't really put a lot of emphasis and a lot of uh, we shouldn't really comment a lot on on what we eat. We we just eat vegetables because because we know they're good for us without necessarily because saying... they're good also they taste good i mean our uh, lebanese tools taste delicious yes, and they are <laughs> perfect because you have all the three food groups in it so you don't have to to go very you know far yeah. very easy things uh, you know you can do very easy meals at home and without uh, you know commenting and show and and modeling yeah. i forgot modeling <laughs> you have to eat with your children yes. family meals are key 
uh, and if you, you know, it's easy to sit there and and you know have your kids eat um, the stew, and you are uh, basically eating uh, a fast food or, or chicken nuggets or nothing yeah. uh, or a salad, you know. So so no, it's not gonna it's, it, no, it's not gonna happen. And interestingly, also, I found even though men suffer from eating disorders for sure, but the proportion is much lower than women, but the expectation on what children eat is also different depending on the gender. Okay. So you will have, uh, you know, girls who will be, you know, put on a more strict uh, diet routine than her brother because really, you know, her looks are really part of what defines yeah. her. But I've seen <clears throat> I've seen little girls eat a burger without the bread, uh, yeah. basically. So, uh, yeah. What a disaster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Either don't eat the burger or eat it the way it, yeah. it should be. And boys have this, you know, I've seen families where boys uh, could order fast food, you know, could have a burger, but the daughter was forced wow. to have, yeah. To that extent. Again, I see extremes, I have to say. Yes. So, yeah, so... Uh, the, going back to the expectations on different genders okay and the and the weight is is basically very much related to self-esteem because we are taught to the body shape and weight both yeah. because it, uh, i mean it's oh, yes, kind absolutely. of a, it's kind of a lose lose because even if you're thin but you don't have now it's the shape the, the curve bum, the, the bum, bum exactly yeah. then also you know yes. you're not good enough but this is a message that is i mean even if you live in our society if you have a strong family environment that does not put an emphasis on that, that does not link your value to uh, being a specific body shape and weight, and that does not link their own love, because what happens is that kids f feel that if they're not thin or if they, they don't you know, fit into a specific uh, body weight and shape, they are not going to be loved by their parents. If they lose weight, they will have this love. Our, a parent's love should be unconditional. Yes. Unconditional. So uh, I'm French educated. So <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, so that's th that's the problem. If you're able to do that at home, associate worth with other things than your body weight and shape and exclusively physical appearance, then uh, you are shielding them from the messages of society, I believe, to a certain extent. Okay, let's take a quick break. Sure. Have you have you personally faced a bias at uh, at work? Uh, yes, of course, <laughs> of course. Now I don't have it as bad as others for sure, but um, it's it's very well known that in the healthcare uh, industry or you know world, women are definitely discriminated. So if you just look at numbers until today, if you compare uh, males to females. Within the same medical specialty, males earn 100K more per year than their female <laughs> counterparts. Imagine. Wow. Okay. It's insane. And the other funny thing also is that women are twice as likely, women doctor, twice as likely to be addressed by their first name oh. versus their uh, male counterpart who are going to be doctor something. And then women doctor are, you know, they see the badge and they're gonna use the first names. It's, um, this is a study that has been published in uh, JAMA. So, you know, like it's a real study. <laughs> okay. It's insane. Personally, I mean, I, um, I have definitely faced it, not from my peers. I think, you know, um, with my peers, it's, it always went well, but uh, mainly from a more senior level where uh, you are in meetings with only men and um, the way they address you is definitely different than the way they address the other, the males that are in the room. Okay. I've worked very hard to earn respect, so I am very respected. It was not given to me de facto, but I have it now. Uh, I've maybe had one incident where I was so upset uh, that I asked, you know, one of my... Um, Colleagues, again, we're talking senior management, if uh, he would have spoken to me like that if I were a man. He did not answer, but uh, our relationship changed since then. He's very nice now and very respectful. <laughs> so sometimes it's good to put people, you know, back in their place. But it's, it, it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. I, I get asked all the time, um, you know, as someone who is an entrepreneur and someone who has had to go fundraise and someone who has had to hire people and, and talk to different stakeholders if, if I experienced bias. And 
I, you know, I don't know, and some like I don't think it was done to me directly, but I, I've I've also read a few studies about that, and I think there's a lot of indirect bias that you that you get. So maybe someone might not tell you specifically to your face. But what they say behind your back. Yes, we're a victim of many, many biases, I believe. And I'm sure there is a lot that we don't hear. What you're saying about behind your back, I am sure it happens. Yeah. I am sure it happens a lot. You know, uh, you know what, who does she think she is? Uh, I am, I'm the only woman in, in senior management. All, of, all, all the rest are men or my colleagues are men. So imagine, you know, it's not uh, it's not easy, and specifically, I think in this part of the world. Though again, I uh, we we I think we get along well, and but uh, you know all those internalized preconceptions. I I don't think it's their fault. I forgive them because I I understand this is what they were taught and probably what was modeled at home. So a lot of it is maybe beyond their control. Um, and it's not, most probably, it's not against me as Karin. It's just the way, you know, they think. Mm -hmm. And they might not be aware of it because we all have this internalized bias in us, which internalized stigma bias that we don't, you know, we don't realize. So um, I think now I've made peace with it. You're, you're an expert on setting boundaries, right? I, 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 Every time in mental health, in a mental health discussion, you hear the word boundaries, boundaries. Uh, so, so is it, is the recommendation, you know, to, to set those boundaries or to answer back and say something? Or as you said, just pick your battles and... Uh, I mean, I think depending on your age and uh, where you are, there are unacceptable situations and mm -hmm. you have to fight them, you know, if... For you, forget humanity and uh, you know women's right and your your daughter's right because these are you know aggressions uh, done done to you. So you have to put boundaries there for sure. And even if it means losing your job, you know there are unacceptable behaviors for sure. Um, but in general, you need to pick your battles because unfortunately, you are fighting is is very you know it's it's judged so when you fight for your rights especially as a woman you are uh, aggressive mm. and uh, when men you know answer back they are assertive mm. we, th there is this um, stereotype as well yes. so when you stand for your rights when you speak uh, your truth you are being judged so you have an initial problem and then you have a secondary problem that your style is, uh, I mean, I've, I've faced that a lot because I'm very spontaneous and also I speak my, my truth and if something is wrong, I say it. And I've always had the advice, you have to be more politically correct. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and it makes me think, do I want to, you know, work uh, in a big corporation or do I prefer to be on my own? So, so these incidents make you think about, are you going to fight or are you going to move on? Mm -hmm. to, uh, is this for you or not? So it should trigger some kind of uh, reflection on um, where do you think you fit um, more. It goes uh, back to your values. Yes, instead of trying to change the world, which unfortunately we're not going to, we can make our own difference every day as much as we can. But fighting with, uh, with people and wasting your time and energy because nothing is going to change, um, maybe not uh, the best way to go about it. Mm. Maybe you should consider uh, where you are and maybe there are other environments that will suit, suit you better. Yeah. And, and everything that you discussed has a, a mental health uh, uh, impact. Of course. Right? And I'm sure a lot of these women end up coming to your clinic and, uh, and, and they, they, they share some of these issues. Are there uh, maybe specific issues that you see given your experience here in the region uh, that you see with women uh, more than men, especially when it comes to the... the, the I mean, the, the whole uh, midlife crisis is... Uh, is uh, I mean, I'm going to label it midlife crisis. It's more complex than that. But I think specifically in, in this region, in, in the GCC, a lot of women have followed their husbands. And, uh, you know, we don't have a family here. Most of us uh, do not have the family support. So a lot of them have had... So the expats. So you the, mean, expats the, expat women. the expat women have had to you know, compromise on their careers or, or stop working to take care of their children. And, um, and then, 
with time, the children grew up, they noticed maybe a drift with their partner who was evolving professionally, and they tried to go back to the workforce, and it was impossible, either because uh, they lacked the self-confidence to, to apply for positions, or either because of the gap on their CVs, they, uh, they were always offered really basic jobs, um, underpaid and uh, things like that, which they couldn't accept. So um, this is why you see a lot of uh, women who became coaches, mm -hmm. uh, nutrition coaches, because this is a training that is relatively you know, easy to get. And, uh, and you can work independently, et cetera. You don't have to apply for... Uh, so I think it's, it's unfair on women who have had to kind of... I don't like the, the word sacrifice, and definitely children should not feel that their mothers are sacrificing anything for them. It should be presented as a choice. I'm home because I choose to be home. And not because I am sacrificing and it's because of you and make them carry this burden. I think it is a very, a, a very important point I've had so many patients that were not, I'm not talking about expats in general, but women who did not work and who made uh, the children, you know, like carry the, the burden. I'm not financially independent because of you. I'm home because of you. And I think this is very detrimental for children. So it's, it's unfair to women who, you know, did compromise on their professional life because they had no, and a lot of uh, men, uh, even now t traveled a lot for their work. So, so really technically they could not work because someone had to be home mm -hmm. to, to, to take, even if you have help, you cannot have your children you know, uh, all the time with the help. Uh, some parent figure has to be there once in a while. Yes. So if you have a husband who travels all the time and who's only there on the weekend, and if you're working very long hours, you can't be there work. for, yeah, I mean, it doesn't work. So, and then the kids grew up and, and they, found themselves bored and with no sense of purpose. And it was very difficult to enter the workplace. I have a lot of, of, of women in this situation. A lot, a lot of my, uh, of my patients are there. It's difficult. Okay. And what about the women who are working? So, so this is the case of women who, uh, who made the choice, whether willingly or whether they had to. Uh, and, uh, and they, uh, they were, you know, they focused on being mothers. Uh, and then what about the other women, the ones that who said, okay, no, I'm going to keep working? Because there's a lot of guilt there and shaming there's there as well. There's a lot of shaming there. I mean, I think women uh, always lose. You can't win. <sighs> if, you are, <laughs> if, you are, uh, if you are working when your children are young, you are ashamed, you are, uh, you know, guilt-tripped, you are judged. And specifically, if you do not need to work, it's even worse, you know. And and okay. and 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 then when uh, your children grow grow up, you're expected to be this successful career woman. Like mm -hmm. you're expected to transition exactly at the moment where your kids, you know, go to uni or whatever. Now magically, so you've been at home uh, when they were young because this is what you know you were supposed to do. And then magically, you should be a successful working woman. Uh, when they go to uni. How is this possible? Mm -hmm. So you are shamed when you are a young uh, working mother, and I have been shamed extensively. I remember you I have had three a neighbor. children. I have three children, yes. I, I, had a, I have a neighbor, had a neighbor, who uh, once, um, she saw my children in the compound, they were playing. She spoke to them a bit, my daughter, I did not have my son yet. And then she, she saw me at maybe a function or something, and she came and she told me, I want to congratulate you. I was really surprised to see that your daughters are doing well. No, no, but really, I said, but why wouldn't they be doing well? <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, because you're working and you're working a lot. So, um, so I was really surprised, but I don't know how, you, how, how they are, but they are doing well. They seem well and well adapted. I'm like, oh my God, you know, so definitely I was very much shamed. Not only me, others, I had a friend, I have a friend who used to send her daughter to the park with a nanny. Okay, because she's working as well. And then once uh, she met uh, the mom of the friend of her daughter, who was there at the park usually every day with the nanny. And when she met her, she, she told her, oh, uh, X, the little girl, has a mother. Oh, wow. You know, so, so yes. And then uh, women, unfortunately, who are now, you know, mid-aged and do not work, uh, 
also are being shamed for not working. I mean, what does she do the whole day? Ah, uh, she goes and has coffees and does her nails and her, man does her hair. I mean, it's unfair both ways. Yeah. It's, it's really, you can't win. But the, but the judgment is always also coming from, from other women. From other women, you're so right. <laughs> yes, yes, mostly from other women. So, Mostly. So why are we why are we judgmental? I think there's a jealousy and, and envy, uh, you know, in um, in uh, some cases, low self esteem, wanting to feel that you did the ro the right choice, though you feel you know internally that maybe, you know, it was a mistake not to work when you were uh, when you had children for some of them, and I think we have a lot of internalized stigma. We have a lot of internalized bias, so. Um, we all judge, we, we live in a society that is based on judgment and we judge based on what we have been taught is right or wrong. This is why I say the biggest gift you can make to your children is to let them think for themselves and not to impose your own opinions on what's right and wrong on them. Let them figure it out. Uh, so we have this internal bias and, and we judge accordingly. And there's this idea that, you know, women with young children should dedicate their lives to just raising those kids if they can financially afford it. And then, uh, you know, uh, later on they should be busy because otherwise what are they going to do? They're going to shop and, you know, spend time and spend the husband's money. So uh, this, these, uh, this internalized uh, biases, I think uh, self-awareness is, is, is very important when you, I mean, I judge, I'm not gonna, I'm definitely far from being perfect and I catch myself, you know, sometimes specifically my father's, you know, internalized in me and he did have, you know, strong opinions and sometimes I catch myself and I, I, I tell him, get out of my body, get out of my body. <laughs> So, um, so yes, you have to, I mean, I have been to therapy extensively. I believe any mental health professional should, and, and definitely more aware of my, uh, of my, yeah. uh, yes, but I definitely catch myself judging and then I take a step back. And sometimes I also am envious, you know, when I was young and working and exhausted because I used to do nights and because I, because I was working, I felt guilty for not spending enough time with, uh, time with my children, my young children. So I wanted to do more. So I used to do nights and then wake up in the morning and take to nursery and then go work and then come back and make sure and then the breastfeeding in between. I was exhausted and I was, I, I did catch myself being a bit envious of those other women who, had I mean I had help of course throughout, but who you know had the luxury to sleep in in the morning after let's say they have decided to 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 be up with their kids at night they could sleep in the morning they could take it easy they could go to the gym as frequently as they wanted I did catch myself judging and saying ah but they don't you know they don't work and I did. But then, you know, different uh, journeys, different paths, and we need to respect each other's it's choices. A choice. Let's talk <laughs> about how they call me from school now. <laughs> ah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so, yeah, going back, uh, go, going back to expectations, right? And how unfair <laughs> they are. Yeah, so, so you just got a call from, from your daughter's school. She's not feeling well. Exactly. And, and you're the one that gets the call. Always. Always. Though, you know, both our numbers are listed yeah. as primary numbers, but never in the history of my children going to nursery or school was my husband called first. Never. You know, never. It's just, I, I just, till now, yeah. I was like, why are they calling me? Okay, my husband is away, so thank God they called me. But I mean... They always call him if I don't answer because I'm in sessions the mm -hmm. whole time. So I barely answer my phone. Actually, I, I only answer when I when I don't know the number because it's a zero four because I, I'm thinking it must be the school. Otherwise, I never answer. People have to reach me via WhatsApp if they want to. So never, never, never have I not been called the first one. Always they call me three, four times, and then in desperation they call my husband. Yeah. It's it's so it's so. I mean, I'm even the WhatsApp groups. Uh, <coughs> all I mean, the, the WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups, groups are all mothers' groups. All the WhatsApp <coughs> groups are all mothers' groups, yeah. and and uh, and if I ever, you know dare to suggest it to my husband he's like are you are you insane yeah. you know so so these are all i mean i work a lot so so i i definitely yeah. work at least as much as him why would i be the one receiving the call um, and why would I be the one expected to go to birthday parties? And yes. uh, why would I be the one expected 
to you know go at school when they have their steam i mean i love to do that but it you know it should if i don't go i should not be shamed because i'm not going yes. you know you know what i mean i can also sometimes my husband can go and sometimes i can go or sometimes we can both of us go but there's this expectation that it's the mom which which is responsible for those those kind of uh, things plus you're supposed to look good so you're supposed to find time to go to the hairdresser and do your nails and you know because not for people but for yourself it feels good you know it feels good it's self care more than anything else and go to the gym a bit and then you're supposed to work harder than your uh, male counterparts because we to know earn, to earn maybe as much as, as they much do or, exactly or you know that it's a, it's a very uh, sad truth that we women need to work harder and more in terms of time to have the same salary as uh, our male counterparts and to earn the same respect if we ever do and uh, be there you know uh, on those things logistic for your kids yes how can we do that i mean you have to be superwoman i don't know how actually and that's 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 the point that i wanted to do to say and and i lost my train of thought earlier is that you know w women uh, girls start off uh we start off on equal footings right when we're born and actually uh, when we're born only yeah. <laughs> and uh, no and actually you know girls there's there's a lot of things where girls do better than uh, better than boys like for example on certain uh, tests uh, uh, in, in school, etc. And now you have more girls going into university as well. Mm -hmm. So everything, you know, goes, of course, other than what you talked about and how things happen at home and the messages that you're getting at home and the modeling that you're seeing at home. But we start off well, you know, and then all of a sudden we become dependent on men. Like when I think I feel like when when somebody gets married, all of a sudden is someone should take care of me, you know? There, there's this person who's gonna take care of me for the rest of my life or until I marry someone else. And, and I think I, I picked up on that because you said we are not victims. And, and I feel that sometimes we, we act like victims, like sometimes the, the responsibility is also on us. Yes, and I think maybe I don't wanna, you know, come across as, um, I think my message maybe was not clear we are all dependent to a certain extent, you know, we are emotional beings. So it's not, ah, you have to be independent as you have to be a robot and... and um, no, that's, no. And uh, so, of course, I'm dependent on my husband. I may not be financially dependent. But he's also dependent on you. Uh, but he's dependent on me as well, absolutely. Yeah. We're dependent on each other emotionally. We're yeah. dependent on each other even more maybe than if we were living uh, in our home countries because we have only each other, kind yeah. of. Uh, I'm dependent on him for, for the, with the children and he's dependent on me for the children yeah. as well. So this is all normal. But I guess, uh, you know, the the... You can fight for what you want also, you know, if, if, if you want to be independent financially, if you really want to, you can, you can, you know, it's not, you're not doomed because of your gender. Um, I think this is an important point, but being dependent is, um, is nice. It's, it's also nice to be able to rely on someone and not be on your own facing the world. The world is tough, full of adversity. This is why I believe loneliness is, is a big problem. Anyhow, it's a big pandemic, loneliness. We as human beings, we are biologically driven to be connected and uh, families have replaced tribes. So I'm not saying families should be for everyone, but I mean being, you know, having at least a community or a, or a partner makes you stronger in the face of adversity. And it's okay, there's no problem there. It doesn't make you a weak person. And maybe the fashion a superwoman, no, you need your, your spouse. Yeah, and, uh, no, your partner it doesn't have to be your spouse. Yeah, but I think you, you, you both need each other. And, and I think what I don't like personally is when you are a woman, you are not a child, right? So you, you, you don't need someone to basically provide for you and, and, and take care of you and, and give you everything you need because you can also do that for yourself. Yes, and you can do that it for him as well. So you, can, you, you also can be in different phases of your life where your husband might decide to, t to take a sabbatical yeah. and you might be the one providing for exactly. the family and it's okay. Exactly. And vice versa, you yeah. might want to take a year off after having your child because it's your th third or fourth child and you're not going to have any more children and you want to really live this motherhood. You want to breastfeed for a year comfortably and your husband provides for you. There's no problem yeah, yeah, both ways, but it should not be one way only. 
Yeah. You are uh, you are your own person, I think, and you uh, you know it's a choice. And uh, no boxes, like really. I mean, as long I believe that as we're not very. I mean, as long as we're not alone, it doesn't have to be a spouse, but a, a community, a family, because this I think is difficult. Again, adversity. Uh, you can have different models. You can choose to work a bit, work a lot, work just to cover your basic needs. You can pursue a career that is going to be extremely successful where you are going to choose not to have children. Some women do not want to have children. Yes. It's also, and well, it's people judged. People find that shocking, by the way. I don't know why, but it's, some, uh, yeah. It, it's <laughs> judged, and also these women are shamed. You know, it is not something that everyone wants to. And, and some women will gladly and wholeheartedly choose to be at home moms yeah. and they will be at peace with this decision and they will be very happy yes. you know if they can if they can afford it financially great respect to them yes. you know there's not one model this is the thing with this whole shift between you know we uh, we want to be independent and and we want to be you know uh, the equal of men uh, fantastic, but that doesn't put you, sh you should not put yourself in this box where you have the pressure to uh, to have this career. I have two daughters and they are very different. One of them is an artist and she wants to pursue, you know, art in Florence and Milan and all of that. And the other one is such a high achiever. She wants, she has this career path for her. And I mean, she doesn't know that what she wants to do, but she knows she wants to be very successful and make a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen, but they are completely different uh, uh, in their, you know, understanding of what, would work for them and, and there's no right or wrong. So, so just to conclude, I think because we're shooting this on the occasion of International Women's Day, um, and I think the, you know, this is a fight for everybody, not only for women. Uh, I think the men play uh, as big of a role Absolutely. Uh, in, in our lives and our development uh, as much as women and, and as parents as well. I think we play a very big role I spoke twice kids. of my dad, uh, even though it's a, <laughs> it's a woman's day. But yes, absolutely. I yeah. believe fathers have a huge role to play in, in you know, uh, uh, shaping or, or motivating uh, their daughters not to be limited. And again, not imposing one model, but not to limit themselves. I think the message that comes from fathers is even maybe greater than the ones that they have from their mothers. Because when it comes from a man, then automatically, you know, it has, it, if a man believes that a woman should be, uh, it's, it's even stronger, I believe. Okay. Any final thoughts or parting thoughts to all the women and the men that are, uh, that are listening to this podcast? Uh, <laughs> I mean, definitely, I haven't figured it all out. Um, I think, again, it's offering your children the freedom of choice and thinking both of them, men, w boys and girls, and, and uh, trying to, to give them as many opportunities as we can with the means we have and let them decide. While, you know, uh, of course, reminding them of basic things of life, you know. Um, and uh, for women who are, you know, maybe uh, struggling in this you know midlife crisis kind of thing you don't have to have it all figured out at 40 or at 50 you know you still have time we are work a work in progress and uh, and you are going to evolve and what you wanted at 20 and you're not happy with at 40 is completely normal you you, you know we're all always working on ourselves and be be compassionate with yourself whatever you've made as a choice when you were 20 was the choice you had to make probably then and going back and regretting is not going to help you because you cannot change the past what you can change is now and the future so this is where your energy should should be thinking and reflecting on your life now and where you would like it to move and how you would like it to move forward and what you are going to do today to get it to move in that direction rather than being depressed because of the past well, thank you so much, Karin. It was great to thank have you. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Conversations with Lulu with my guest, Karin Al-Khazan Hadati. 
Don't forget to check out the show's website, conversationswithlulu.com, to see all the other episodes. You can also reach out to me via my website or on all social media platforms at Lulu Hazen. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to or watch your podcast and give us a rating and a review. It really helps in getting the show discovered. I wish you lots of love and see you in a few weeks.